So we will now turn our attention to a technique called dynamic programming. So let us go back to the kind of recursive functions that we have been writing. So typically recursive functions arise from inductive definitions. So for instance, we can define factorial inductively by defining the base case, the factorial of 0 is 1 and for arbitrary n bigger than 1, the factorial of n can be got by multiplying the recursive call factorial n minus 1. So inductively we know how to compute that and multiplying it by n. We can also do this for structures. So we can do induction on the structure of a list. So we can say that if we want to do, for example, insertion sort, then for the empty list, it is already sorted. So the insertion sort of the empty list, so this is like the 0 case, is just the empty list. And if we need to sort a list from with x0 to xn with n plus 1 elements, then what we can do is we can sort the first n elements inductively. So we do insertion sort on x0 to xn minus 1. And then we insert the last element into this, right. So insert is a separate function, which is like the, so it is like multiply, right. So it is a separate function that we use to combine the inductive case with the element which we are currently dealing with. You can also write insert inductively, but we will not bother about that for now. So once we have these inductive definitions, then when we write code for this, then they naturally become recursive functions, right. So the factorial function will say if n is smaller than is 0 or less, return 1, otherwise return n times factorial of n minus 1. Similarly, the insertion sort function will say that if the list you are given is empty, then return that list, otherwise insert into the list up to but not including the last element, right, insert the last element and then so you assume that this is sorted inductively or recursively and then you insert. So this is how it works when we have inductive definitions, we get recursive programs. So the reason that this works in general is that we have these sub problems, right. So we have these sub problems and we are combining these sub problems to solve our original problem. So for example, when I look at factorial of n, then I need to solve the sub problem factorial of n minus 1. But factorial of n minus 1 in turn will ask me to solve the problem of factorial n minus 2. So all the smaller versions of factorial n minus 1, n minus 2 up to 0 are all sub problems of the problem I am going to solve now. And once I can solve them, I can kind of bring them together and solve this problem. Similarly, if I want to sort a list, right, I will have to, by insertion sort, then I will have to be able to sort that prefix, right, from 0 to n minus 1. So if I, <coughs> So if I sort from 0 to n minus 1, then I can sort from 0 to n. But in general, I might end up having to sort different segments. So I should think about any sequence xi to xj as a sub problem of this, right. So now let us look at this sub problem situation in a different context. So remember this interval scheduling problem. So the interval scheduling problem is something we encountered when we looked at greedy algorithms. So we said that we had some resource, for example, we said there is a video classroom which is going to be used by a number of faculty members and each faculty member has a fixed slot, right. So they have a time period when they would like to use the classroom. But since no two people can use the classroom at the same time, we have to choose a subset of slots to schedule during the week. And in the interval scheduling problem, our criterion was to keep the maximum number of people happy. So we wanted to satisfy as many requests as possible. So you wanted to choose a subset of bookings so that the number of teachers who got their booking was maximized. We were not concerned about, for example, maximizing the utilization of the room in terms of the number of hours of recording or something like that. So here we have sub problems. So each subset of bookings is a sub problem, right. And we have this greedy strategy which says pick based on some criterion the first request to schedule. And once I schedule that request, there are some other requests which overlap with it because they have, a, you know, the starting time or any time is such that I cannot schedule them both together. So I have to remove those. And once I remove that, I get what remains and that is a subset of the original problem which I have to solve. So that is why every subset in general is a sub problem, right. So this is also there. So this kind of inductive structure, though we, we did not use an inductive solution in the greedy thing there is an inductive thing going on. That is in order to solve the whole problem, I take something out and then I solve a smaller version of the same problem. So each subset is a small, is a sub problem. Now, of course, since subsets are exponential, if I have n bookings, there are 2 to the n subsets. 
there are in principle two to the end different sub problems. So ideally I would need to look at all of these subsets. So every subset tells me something about how it can be solved and I would have to look at the best of these. But the reason that the greedy strategy is attractive is that it does not look at all of them, right? It only looks at a fraction of sub problems. But along with this, we have this side effect that every choice that we make rules out a large number of sub problems. So we need to make sure that the optimal solution we are looking for has not been ruled out by looking at, by making a poor choice. So whenever we make this kind of a greedy strategy, then we need to prove optimality because we cannot be sure otherwise that the choices that we have thrown away are not going to be bad. So we saw that there were many kind of incorrect greedy strategy for which we could explicitly come up with counter examples. Just because you cannot come up with a counter example does not mean that the greedy strategy is correct. So you must necessarily prove that it is correct and we gave some arguments for it. We talked about exchange arguments or showing in this case that the interval scheduling using the greedy strategy always stays ahead of the optimal schedule and so on. So let's look at now a variant of this problem. So remember we said that in this interval scheduling problem, we are only interested in maximizing the total utilization in terms of the faculty. We have want to keep as many people happy as possible, but we are not looking at any resource in terms of the room utilization. But supposing we are getting something from the room, right? So let's assume for instance, that this is actually a, not a, a captive resource inside IIT Madras, but it's a commercial facility. So in a commercial facility, Right? So you charge rent for usage. So each person who makes a booking is willing to pay a certain amount of money. So there is a certain weight associated with the booking. Right? It need not just be the length. It just could also be that some people for ha have an urgent requirement, they're willing to pay more. So for each request, there is also a weight. Right? You can think of it as how much money you're going to earn if you satisfy that request. But the constraint is still the same. That is, these requests are fixed in time. They must be from a starting time to an ending time. They cannot shift and you cannot have two overlapping requests satisfied at the same time. So now our goal becomes different. We are no longer interested necessarily in keeping the maximum number of customers happy. Rather, we are interested in maximizing our revenue. So as the owners of this facility, we would like to maximize the total weight. In this case, the total income that we get as rent from renting out this facility. So if you remember the greedy strategy that we had for the earlier question, which is to maximize the number of users who use it, we said that you just take the earliest deadline, right? So you look at the first job that's going to finish and schedule it first, knock out all the jobs which overlap with it. Now among those that remain, you take the first job that's going to finish, schedule it and so on, right? So we had this earliest deadline or the earliest finish time as our greedy strategy. But it's quite easy to come up with a weighted example where this doesn't work, right? So here is a trivial case. So I have three requests. Two of them have weight one and one of them has weight three. So it is very clear that the best choice for me is to use the job or to schedule the job, which is weight three. Now, if I were just trying to maximize the number of customers as before, I would take this one and schedule it, right? And then this would mean that this goes out. And then because the other one starts later, I would schedule that. So I would get two happy customers, but my revenue would be only two. Whereas if I did not go by the earliest deadline, but somehow were able to take into account the weights that I had, then I would actually prefer to take just this one customer who's willing to pay three units and thereby get more than I would get by servicing the other two customers. So this earliest deadline is no longer a valid greedy strategy. If I add weights and I now want to maximize the weight of the schedule. So what should I do? So can I look for a different greedy strategy, right? So I can start looking, saying, okay, maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe I want to find now. Remember earlier also we talked about the, we talked about the longest job, the shortest job. There were various other parameters that we used. So we could now also look at the, the most revenue earning job. Maybe we want to make that a priority or we can take revenue into time or revenue divided by time. There are many, there is no shortage of, uh, you know, these kind of metrics that you can use in order to evaluate jobs. And then whichever one we choose, we either have to search for a counter example or prove that it is correct. Okay. But the other way which is more reliable is to actually somehow exploit the fact that we have these sub problems. So this is no different in a way from factorial or insertion sort or something. So the solution to the original problem depends on sub problems. 
So can we take those sub problems and build up a solution to original problem exactly as we do there. So can we find a kind of inductive structure to this weighted interval scheduling problem. So here is a way to do that systematically. So let us just arrange the jobs in some natural order. So we can say we can arrange them by their starting time. So remember every request has a starting time and an ending time. So B1 is the first starting time, B2 is the second starting time and so on. Of course, they could have multiple jobs the same starting time in which case we will order them in some reasonable way. But let us for convenience assume that our n requests have n different starting times and B1 to Bn represents the order of the starting times in increasing order. So let us look at B1. So what happens with B1? Well, I do not know the solution, but I know that either B1 is there in the optimum solution or there is an optimum solution without B1, right? There are only two choices. Either I can find an optimum solution with B1 or if I take B1, I am not going to find an optimum solution. So then I will explore both the possibilities, right? So I will say that either B1 is part of an optimum solution or it is not. So I let us assume that it is part of an optimum solution. Then it will rule out things which overlap with it, right? And these things which overlap with it will come in sequence, right? Because the starting times are in an order. So maybe B2 overlaps, maybe B3 overlaps, maybe B4 is the first job which starts after B1 finishes. And if B4 starts after B1 finishes, so does B5 because B5 starts after B4. So there will be a certain number of jobs, B2, B3 maybe which get ruled out. So now I will have to solve the, re the remaining problem in this particular concrete case for B4 onwards. So if I include B1, then I must kick out B2, B3 and go to B4. On the other hand, if I do not include B1, then I just knock B1 out and I have a resulting problem which has B2 up to Bn. Right? So these are now my two sub problems and now what do I not need to do? I do not know which one of these is the correct answer, right? I do not know whether I should have kept B1 or I should have dropped B1, but let us assume inductively I can solve these smaller sub problems. So if I have solved the smaller sub problems, right, then I can just take the maximum of the two in the sense that if I include B1, I get the revenue from B1 plus the whatever I have solved. If I exclude B1, I get the revenue from whatever else, but I do not get the revenue of B1. Whichever of them gives me more revenue, more weight, I use that. Right? <coughs> so this is a kind of exhaustive solution which in some sense is guaranteed to be correct. Now why is it guaranteed to be correct? Because it does not rule out any possibility up front. See the greedy solution when I make a choice, it rules out a bunch of things which I am never going to look at before and look at again. Right? But this is not like that. So if I if I generalize this argument for B1, if I look at any BJ, right, any, any job in this sequence, either it is part of the solution or it is not part of the solution. right? So in particular for B1, we have checked both cases. So B1, we have checked the case that it is there, it is not there. right? Now what about B2? Well, B2 if it is not in conflict with B1, will be there in this list and in this list. So whether I include B1 or I exclude B1, I will look at a next choice for B2. I will either include B2 or exclude B2, right? So I will I will consider it in the subproblems involving B1 and the subproblems which exclude B1. On the other hand, if B2 is incompatible with B1, right? Then it would not be here because when I choose B1, I have to throw B2 out. But it will be in the second one by guarantee because if I throw out B1, B2 still is possible. So then I would check if B2 is in conflict with B1, I would evaluate all the answers for B2 assuming that B1 has been discarded. So by doing it in this sequence, I know that if B2 is there, B1 is not there. Okay? So there is no problem. So I am not ruling out the fact that B1 was there. The only reason B1 is not there is because without B1, I could not do B2. So this now becomes a kind of recursive thing. I go to B3 and it has the same thing, right? So when I get to B3, either it has been allowed by my previous choices or it has been disallowed, but every situation where it is allowed or disallowed will be considered. I am not going to rule out anything. So what is the problem? Okay? So here is a situation that you might well have, which is that B1 and B2 are incompatible, right? So look at the picture at the bottom. So B1 and B2 are incompatible, right? So B1 and B2 overlap but they are both disjoint from what happens afterwards. So B3, so remember these jobs are, start, are arranged in starting time order. So B1 starts before B2, B2 starts before B3 and so on. But both B1 and B2 finish before B3 starts. So whether I choose B1 or B2, I can freely choose between B3 to Bn, but I cannot choose both B1 and B2. 
So now if I start this uh, exhaustive strategy that I did before, what will happen is I will first look at the case where I choose B1, right. If I choose B1, I must rule out B2 and I must look at these things, right. Or I will exclude B1. If I exclude B1, then this is gone and I am looking at these things, right. So these are the two sub problems in this concrete situation which arise by making my first choice. I keep B1, I drop B2, I keep drop B1, I keep B2 and in both cases I keep B3 to Bn. So now let us look at the case that arises here. So this is should be B2, right. So let us look at the case that arises in the second case, right. So now in the second case, right, I have B2 to Bn and now I must now look at the situation where I am allowed to choose B2 whether I should keep B2 or not. So once again just like B1 was the first choice, in this choice B2 to Bn, I must decide whether to keep B2 or exclude B2, right. Now if I keep B2, right, or I exclude B2, I still have B3 to Bn because I know that B2 is compatible with B3 to Bn. But this B3 to Bn that I am solving here was already being solved in the case where I chose B1. So this is the challenge. The challenge is that when I apply this inductive strategy in this way, when I break down the problem into sub problems, I cannot be guaranteed that the problem that arises from one path, the choice path that came from choosing B1, right, is different from the one that came from keeping B2 or excluding B2, right. So the same sub problem in this case B3 to Bn might arise from different paths, right. And if I, if I use recursion as I had done, right, when we said fact n is equal to n times fact n minus 1, every time we saw an inductive dependence, we just replace it by a recursive call. So what is going to happen in this case is that we are actually going to evaluate this once when I am solving for B1 and we are going to solve it again for B2 which is clearly wasteful, right, because the same problem is being solved a second time because we somehow did not recognize that this problem has been solved before, right. So the question is whether we can somehow flag this, right. So we can somehow flag this problem and say that okay B3 to Bn must be considered once and not twice. So if I have solved it once, I should somehow recognize that I have solved it again. So when I come back to this problem later on, I can figure out that this problem has already been solved and I do not need to solve it again. So we will basically, this is what dynamic programming eventually achieves. So we will look at dynamic programming through a number of examples and illustrate why this problem is really bad. I mean this problem is really bad because remember we said that if you have n jobs, then you have 2 to the n possible subsets. So there is really an exponential number of subproblems and if we are going to be solving them again and again, then we are going to be in real trouble, right. So this could actually blow up in terms of a, a very simple recursive solution that we get from an inductive structure might actually turn out to be impossible to compute simply because of this overlap. So unless we fix this overlapping problem, what seems to be a very simple problem to compute could actually be computationally infeasible. So we will look at these two strategies. The first one is basically one where we kind of remember, right. So we come to a problem and we say, okay, this is a problem I have seen before and I will just reuse the answer I have done before. And the other one is dynamic programming where we will say, okay, I will solve the problems, sub problems in such a way that whenever I need one, I will have the answer, okay. So this will become clear as we go along.